In the previous lecture, we looked at our first nonlinear filter, the extended comma filter. The extended comma filter works by approximating the predicted and posterior density as Gaussian densities, by linearizing the nonlinear models and then applying the normal comma filter equations on these linear models. Before we continue to learn more nonlinear filters, we thought we'd try to put the EKF and the other nonlinear filters that we will learn into a bit of a context. And that context is called the family of assumed density filters. Now, performing nonlinear filtering well is difficult. Compared to the linear case, where we know how to calculate the true posterior density, in the nonlinear case, we need to make approximations and simplifications, which naturally will affect our result. Now, the general methodology of all our filtering methods is to recursively, that is, each time we get a new observation, compute the posterior distribution or an approximation of it. Based on this posterior distribution, we then find an estimate of our state using, for example, the posterior mean in the MMSE case, or the most probable value if we are doing map estimation. The general strategy that most methods follow in order to recursively compute the posterior is to start from the posterior at the previous time instance, so p of x k minus 1 given measurements up to k minus 1. So in this recursion, we call this our prior. Now, this prior summarizes everything that we know about the state up to time k minus 1. So the second thing that we usually do is that we use this old information to predict the density of the state at the same time as our new observation. So we want to compute the density p of x k given measurements up to k minus 1. We do this in the so-called prediction step in our filter. The next thing that we typically do is that we update our predicted density with the new information in our current observation, yk, to get our posterior density or updated density, p of xk given y1 to k. Now based on our updated posterior density, we can compute a new estimate of our state at time k, so x hat k given measurements up to time k. And then start the process all over again by simply making this posterior our new prior and then following the same steps again. Note that a prerequisite for us to be able to have this recursive filtering scheme is that our updated posterior density is the same type as the prior that we started with. If this isn't the case, we can't simply exchange what we call the posterior and prior and then start all over, because how we describe our densities have now changed. Now, this might seem obvious to you, but in nonlinear filtering, the true posterior will generally not be of the same type as the prior. So. Up until now, we have seen two examples of filters that uses this methodology to recursively compute the posterior, and that is the comma filter and the extended comma filter. So what else do they have in common? Well, to have a recursive filter, both assume that the prior, predicted density, and the posterior density are all Gaussian. Now, it turns out that this is a rather common strategy, and we will call all filters that do this as Gaussian filters. Now, a Gaussian filter is characterized by assuming that we start each recursion with a Gaussian prior. That is, we assume that the posterior from the previous time instance is Gaussian with this mean and this covariance. So, in the prediction step and the update step in the Gaussian filter, we also want to find the predicted density and the posterior density as Gaussian densities. That is, we want to find the means and the covariances of these Gaussian densities that either describes our predicted and posterior densities exactly, as in the comma filter case, or at least approximately, as in the extended comma filter. Now, the key aspect here is by assuming that the posterior from the previous time instance, that is the prior in the current recursion, and the updated posterior are both Gaussian. We have a recursive algorithm as we are starting and ending with the same type of density. So at the next recursion, this will be our Gaussian prior, and we can do exactly the same thing again, but now we instead update with the measurement yk plus 1, and so on. This means that our filters are simple to implement, and that they will have a predictable complexity for each filter recursion. So all our previous filters, the comma filter, the extended comma filter, and the iterative EKF, are all examples of Gaussian filters. We should perhaps also note that the second step here, the prediction step, does not have to be Gaussian in order for this to be a Gaussian filter. But it's very common that this is the case. Nonetheless, the important thing is that both the prior and the posterior are Gaussian. 
So that was the important family of Gaussian filters, which we will study extensively in this course. If we try to generalize this, however, there is a wide range of Bayesian filters that can be written on the following form. First, we select a density parameterization, p of x and theta, where theta here is the parameters that we use to describe our density. So in the Gaussian filtering case, p here is a Gaussian density, and theta contains the mean and covariance that is needed to describe this density. To start the recursion, we assume that we have an approximation of the posterior from the previous time instance on our assumed density parameterization, where the shape of this approximation is described by theta at k minus 1 given measurements up to k minus 1. The aim is then to find the updated parameters theta k given k, such that our updated posterior can be approximated using the same type of density, but described using our updated parameters theta k given k. So this strategy is sometimes called assumed density filtering or canonical form filtering. As we in each recursion assume that we can approximate our posterior density of a certain type using a specific set of parameters. In the Gaussian filtering case, we assume that the posterior can be described as a Gaussian density using its mean and covariance. But there are other alternatives. Now, this table gives a summary of different commonly used assumed densities and the filtering algorithms that uses them. Our ambition here is not to go into any details regarding the different methods mentioned here, but rather to give some examples of density parameterizations that are used, starting with the far most commonly used parameterization, and that is the Gaussian density. So in the scalar case, it could look something like this, and the parameters that we need to find is the mean, mu, and the covariance p of this density. Examples of filters on this form is the comma filter and the extended comma filter that we have studied so far. We also studied the uncentered comma filter and the cubital comma filter in this course. There are also filters that uses this parameterization to solve the object tracking problem. That is, when we have data association uncertainty, namely the nearest neighbor, the global nearest neighbor, probabilistic data association, and joint probabilistic data association. We will not cover these methods in this course, but the filtering algorithms that we study here is also the basis for these methods. Another alternative that is quite common is to assume that our densities can be described as a weighted sum of Gaussians, where we have a sum of capital N Gaussians that are all weighted by these weights Wi, which can look something like this. in the case where we have three Gaussians in our mixture, all with its own weight, w1, w2, and w3. Now, n here is usually not that large, typically in the single to double digit range. We typically want to use this type of representation when we have some discrete random variable in our states. For example, this could be the class of an object. The weights w then represents the probability mass function of our discrete random variable, and the Gaussian densities would represent our continuous states conditioned on our discrete random variable. Examples of filters that uses this type of parameterization is the interacting multiple model filter and the multi-hypothesis tracking filter. Our next parameterization is a bit different. In this case, we describe our density using a sum of n direct delta functions, which all have a weight associated with them and a state. And the state here we usually call our particle. So we describe our density like this, which turns out to be a very general representation that in theory can be used to approximate any given density arbitrarily well. Now, compared to our Gaussian mixture here, n here is typically in the thousands or even more. We will look at this in detail in a later section when we discuss the particle filters, which are nonlinear filters which uses this type of representation. We will then also look at this type of representation where we have a mix of delta functions and Gaussian densities. And this is used in the Rao Blackwell eyes particle filters. Now, this is no way near a complete list of assumed densities that are used in filtering and object tracking, but it is a list of the more common. And at least all the different representations that we will consider in this course are covered here. 